Mayor, you're muted. I am muted. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Mayor Don Lopez, Village of Los Ranchos de Albuquerque. And I want to welcome all of you to our Village of Los Ranchos de Albuquerque's Board of Trustees special informational meeting. And I'm calling the meeting to order. It is 4 p.m. The Village of Los Ranchos de Albuquerque will be conducting this live meeting via Zoom video conferencing and streaming on its website and Facebook page. This meeting must conclude at 5.30 p.m. at the request of our trustees. At this time, I'm gonna call the roll. Trustee Rael. Here. Trustee Lewis. Present. Trustee Pacheco. Present. Trustee Riccabini. We had to set Trustee Riccabini up in another office. So perhaps we need to check and find out. I know he's here, but he needs to be able to hear the the items that we are talking about. Mr. And can you check he, on him? He's saying he can hear, we just can't hear him. Okay. Uh, there's another way to do that. In the past, I have opened my iPhone. I've opened the meeting in my iPhone and I was able to use the iPhone and the screen on the computer that he's using. Should we let him know that that's one option for him? Mayor, uh, they're troubleshooting right now. Okay, thank you. Sorry for the delay. Trustee Riccamini came to Village Hall to attend the meeting. Okay, I'm being advised to continue the meeting and we'll get him in as soon as possible. So at this time, I'm gonna to move to item three, approval of the agenda. I need a motion to approve the agenda. Move approval of the agenda. I need a second. Second. I'm going to call for the question. Call for the roll call vote. Trustee Rael. Yes. Trustee Lewis. Yes. Trustee Pacheco. Yes. Trustee Riccabini, if you, if you can answer. Okay. Before we begin with the presentations, I would like to ask all of the mm. trustees to hold their questions until the end. Uh, that way we can conserve a little bit of time and get to the most important questions. Item four is presentations. Uh, 4A is Nan Winter, our Village of Los Ranchos attorney. Attorney Winter, please make your presentation. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you're gonna see two Nan Winters on the screen. Um, one of them is actually Keith Herman, my associate here from the office. So um, I had to forward him my invite. So. Um, good afternoon, Mayor, Trustees. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can everybody see that? Yes. All right. Uh, so I'm going to use um, a PowerPoint um, to, to get me through this. Um, Basically, I'm going to take 10 to 15 minutes, Mayor, talking through the Cannabis yes. Regulation Act, House Bill 2, um, cannabis nationally, some litigation, um, dealing with the apparent federal conflict, New Mexico regulations, 
Um, I'm going to speak to Section 12 of the Cannabis Regulation Act regarding local control. Um, that local control is essentially a time, place, and manner type of control. And then I'm going to give you some examples of time, place, and manner. So it's I, I've learned a lot in the last couple of months, um, not only locally, but federally. Um, just want to give you an idea of what happened and uh, uh, State Senator Duhigg can, you know, you know, chime in on some of this too, but um, the Cannabis Regulation Act or the CRA was passed just this 2021 in a special session. Um, it is 178 pages. It was introduced on March 30 and passed on March 31. So a lot of work uh, in Santa Fe in a very short period of time. Um, ironically, of the 178 pages, one page is devoted to local regulation issues, just one page, section 12. Um, the Cannabis Regulation Act has a number of deadlines and some of this might be too small for you to see, but um, you know, critical deadlines are June 29 of 2021. That's when the home growing can take effect. Um, no later than September 1st of 2021, there's supposed to be created a Cannabis Regulatory Advisory Committee um, and the Cannabis Control Division will start accepting and begin processing license applications for producers. Um, no later than January 1st of 2022, uh, the CCD, the Cannabis Control Division, will start promulgating rules, but um, a lot of promulgation has already happened. There are a lot of regs already published with respect to cannabis in New Mexico. Um, no later than April 1st of 2022, the retail sale of commercial cannabis begins. Uh, so um, a lot to do between now and April. Um, as it concerns the Cannabis Regulation Act, um, I just wanted to give you a, a snapshot of what the estimated revenue is going to be for the state and local governments. This comes straight from the fiscal impact report, um, which is attached to the legislation on the legislature's website. Uh, but you can see in this, these numbers are in thousands of dollars. They're estimating $30 million of total general fund revenue recurring by FY24. They're also estimating $15 million worth of local government recurring revenue by 2024. In the short run, in the run up to FY22, they are seeing a reduction or a negative impact to local government revenues. Mostly, I think, based on my read of the FIR, um, that that decrease is related to no GRT imposed on medical marijuana. Uh, I just wanted to also give you a, a sort of where we are nationally, the status of legalization efforts in the United States. Um, as you can see, there are, um, I think last count, um, 18 states that have legalized marijuana for recreational use. Um, there are another dozen um, legal for medical use um, and another dozen that have decriminalized. So New Mexico is following the trend. Uh, there is, and you're going to hear about this later, I'm sure you're going to hear about it in some of the presentations after I'm done here. You're going to hear about this conflict with federal law. And the conflict with federal law was specifically called out in the fiscal impact report uh, uh, um, filed with the legislature. Both the New Mexico Attorney General and the uh, District Attorneys Associations um, in New Mexico advised the legislature, our legislature in 2021, that cannabis is still a federally controlled substance. Um, and the federal government regulates marijuana through the Controlled Substances Act. Under current federal law, marijuana is treated like any other controlled substance like cocaine or heroin. Um, it is classified as a Schedule I drug, which means that the federal government views marijuana as addictive and, and having no medical value. Now, clearly with the map you just saw that you see that the trend is changing on that. Um, in addition to pointing out that there is this conflict with federal law, the New Mexico Attorney General advises that while there are a number of federal criminal penalties associated with distribution and possession and intent to distribute marijuana, um, essentially what happens in New Mexico stays in New Mexico. 
Um, in other words, in New Mexico, a person may cross many different jurisdictions when traveling throughout the state, including federal lands. So while the possession of cannabis under state law may be lawful within the state, the possession of cannabis in some of these checkerboard federal government areas has consequences that are still governed by uh, clearly federal law. So, so if there is this federal conflict, the question then remains why and how can the state do what the state did? And there are several, several avenues that answer that question. Um, one is the Cole Memorandum, um, which issued in 2013 under the Obama administration. Um, it was sent to all U.S. attorneys regarding federal prosecution of offenses related to marijuana. The memo stated that given the limited resources, the Justice Department would not enforce the federal marijuana prohibition in states that, quote, legalize marijuana in some form. The Cole Memorandum um, has been a bit of a political football at the federal level. It was rescinded by Attorney General Sessions in 2018. However, the current AG, Merrick Garland, made it crystal clear that he will reinstitute a version of the Cole Memo. Um, there is also what I will call a, um, a budget rider ongoing right now. Um, I think it's also referred to as the Robichar Farr Amendment. Um, it became law in December 2014. It is something that is passed <clears throat> annually, but essentially um, it's um, a budget rider that says um, um, there will be no federally no federal funds used for prosecution under the Controlled Substances Act. So that's something that's re-upped every year. So basically, the feds have taken a hands-off approach to this. Um, but, you know, it could be argued that the conflict between the state and federal law is likely to continue until resolved. So until resolved um, is happening as we speak. Um, now, I, I would add that being resolved is um, been ongoing, attempts to resolve this have been ongoing for decades. But most recently, the House Judiciary Committee approved the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act. That was just last week. Um, the Moore Act would end the federal prohibition of marijuana. Um, Republicans joined Democrats um, in committee on that bill. Um, it would decriminalize um, and deschedule cannabis and implement a federal tax on marijuana products. Um, it would also do some expunging, um, except for kingpins. Um, who knows what the final outlook is for passage of this bill? Um, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of other things uh, Congress is dealing with right now, including trillions of dollars in spending on infrastructure and social programs. So let's get back to New Mexico real quick. And I, 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 I did want to give you that update sort of on where the feds were, because again, I know it's going to come up later in this presentation, but um, let's get back to New Mexico. And I did indicate that New Mexico has um, implemented um, dozens of regular pages and pages of regulations already um, since March. Um, manufacturers rules are, are fairly onerous. I've um, on this screen page, you can see that I've detailed some of them. Um, you know, chemical extractions using CO2 have to be in a closed loop system. Um, mm. Manufacturers may not be visible from public places. Um, um, uh, manufacturers um, facilities have to be constantly videotaped. Um, they even got into the nitty gritty on the pixels and the frames per second in these 24 hours of videotape. Um, uh, marijuana facilities, growing facilities, and manufacturing facilities must be lit. Any perimeter entrance um, must have lighting sufficient for observers to see and cameras to record any activity within 20 feet. Fencing requirements for outdoor areas are also um, mandatory under the regs. Um, they specify the perimeter security fencing. Um, in, in some, as it concerns manufacturing and production, the regulations make it crystal clear that this is going to be a very expensive proposition for somebody that wants to do this. Um, 
it also kind of points out that um, some of these issues like lighting and uh, fencing may run afoul of the current village um, uh, um, dark skies ordinance and your, your fencing provisions. Um, there's also other areas that um, that the that the state is now regulating um, any licensees cultivation plans or um, has to indicate designated pesticide and chemical storage areas. There has to be um, a designated composting area, and there has to be uh, a designated secure an, uh, area for cannabis waste. So that's sort of the the manufacturers regs. Um, there's, there's a lot more to it. They go on for pages and pages and pages. But um, as I mentioned at the beginning of my presentation, there is one page in this 178 page act that deals with what you can do as a local governing body. And that is section 12 called local control under the Cannabis Regulation Act. And it only has really two sections. And the first section is what a local jurisdiction may do. And the second section is what a local jurisdiction shall not do. And I want you to remember what the local jurisdiction shall not do because that's gonna come into play at the, at the bottom of my presentation. But under the, the Cannabis Regulation Act, a local jurisdiction may adopt time, place and manner rules, including limiting density and operating times. And this is the, the, the needle that we have to thread that Tiffany has, proposed to thread for you on where and how you regulate um, cannabis in the village. Um, the other thing a jurisdiction may do is allow for smoking ingesting within an indoor outdoor area if it's restricted to persons older than 21 and not more than 300 feet from a school or daycare. Now, the shall nots. And the shall nots are one, prevent transportation of cannabis completely prohibit li a licensee, prohibit or limit signage, require a premise to be, be more than 300 feet from a school or daycare, require an existing licensee to relocate, that's sort of a grandfathering thing, and you cannot prohibit homegrown cannabis. So I um, neglected to put this slide where it belonged, but I did want to touch on um, litigation, you know, surrounding um, the federal act and, um, um, you know, whether or not this comes into play here in your consideration. Um, the preeminent case right now is really not that old because Colorado was the first to adopt, um, um, was one of the first states to legalize recreational use. So, clearly Colorado would come up with the case, right? It's Safe Streets Alliance versus Higginlooper. Um, it was um, heard by the 10th Circuit in 2017. It went back to district court in 2018. So one thing that case said with this is that this is still a developing area of law um, and that what you're seeing in this case presents the usual claims regarding criminal activity, nuisances and marijuana. What the case, what the 10th Circuit ultimately held was that there is no private right of action um, um, under the Controlled Substance Act or the U.S. Constitution. In other words, no neighbor can invoke the Controlled Substance Act to sue another neighbor who might be growing marijuana. Um, however, in the Higginlooper case, that court determined that there were issues regarding diminished property values related to odors. And then that 10th Circuit Court remanded the odor issue back to the district court. The district court heard the facts and decided that the, the, the neighbors that were complaining about the odor failed to prove that there was a nuisance related to the odor and failed to prove that there was a diminished value to their property. In other words, um, the, the dispensary, the farm actually won all, everything after years of litigation. Um, I did put a paragraph in here that um, in this case, a chemical engineer used something called a nasal ranger detection device to sniff odors. I suspect you might be headed in that direction someday. 
Um, so because this issue um, was so complicated for me, um, I drew myself a picture and this is the picture. I probably make, try not to prejudge my pictures, but this is my, my way of understanding what you as a local government can do. And at the red end of this continuum is the just say no status quo. Um, right now, your local government code precludes any use, consumption, production of marijuana. Of course, we're looking at that, we're revising that, we have to come in co into compliance with the CRA. Um, so this whole just say no thing is gonna change, but that's one end of the continuum. The other end of the continuum is that you allow production, cultivation and use in every zone within the village. And along this continuum are, are ways that you can um, regulate um, uses um, and production and manufacturing in the various zones. And I, I don't want to say that any one of these dots on this page is truly representative of what Tiffany will present later, but each of these dots represents um, a you know, a possibility. Um, so at the farthest left end of the spectrum, the just say no, which we know is illegal under the Cannabis Regulation Act, you could say that you would allow a permissive or conditional use only in C1. Um, and that is a fairly limiting restriction. Um, and as you see, I have placed dots along here. You can see that as you get closer to the right end of the spectrum, you can see that there is more and more, um, you know, conditions and uses and authorizations um, as you get closer to being permissive in every zone. Um, it is your job to craft the right regulation for your community. And I'll get into that in a little bit more later. So local government conditions, um, you may impose a conditions that are necessary to ensure that the use is compatible with other uses in the vicinity and that the negative impact on the proposed use on the surrounding uses and public facilities is minimized. So when you go to decide where you want to be on this ordinance next week or next month, um, we really need facts in the record that establish why a use is compatible in any particular vicinity or what negative impact might be implicated in that vicinity. So those, you know, that's, you all will have to look at your village, look at your needs and wants, look at the impacts um, and make your decision accordingly. So, so Nan, let me interject quickly. This is Mayor Lopez. You're right at 17 minutes. I don't okay. know if you have too much more. Okay, I'll give you, I'll, I'll go through. Um, so what conditions can you impose? You can impose limiting hours, days, place, or manner of operations. You can require architectural design features. You can require waste disposal programs. You can limit building height, size, and coverage. You're doing some of that already. Um, you can designate the size, number, and location of parking areas. You can require landscaping. You can limit setbacks and standards for lighting. Um, some examples of these time, place, and manner conditions, um, and I'm these are pulled from Corrales, Gallup, and some of Tiffany's work. Um, it cannot be located within 300 feet of a school. Um, retail sales between midnight and 8 p.m. are prohibited. No consumption um, between midnight and 8 a.m. That's something I think Tiffany's talking about. Um, disease, dead, or dying agricultural products products have to be disposed of immediately. Um, no smoking shall be permitted outdoors. Um, I thought the, you know, all, I mean, each of these communities considered their individual needs and came up with something different. Um, and Gallup has to be screened, screened from view from each property line, not facing a public street. Um, personal cannabis cultivation and processing shall not occur in the common areas of a multifamily dwelling. 
Um, Gallup wanted no use of compressed gases. To, I mean, go figure. I'm not sure where they came up with that. Hmm. The bottom the bottom line, Mayor, is that um, you must comply with the Cannabis Regulation Act and the six local jurisdiction shall nots. There is, however, room for discretion on conditions, and it's your choice, your community. You aren't Albuquerque, you aren't Corrales, you aren't anyone else, you're just the village. So Thank you very much, Nan, I appreciate it. Uh, I understand that Mr. Randy Audio, the council to the village of Los Corrales will not be able to attend. So we are now gonna to move to Mr. Mel Eves. Uh, Mel, are you hmm. on? I'm here. Good, Mel, you have approximately 10 minutes. Okay, I, I, think Nan did, I think Nan did a really good job of briefing everybody on the federal status of the federal law. And, um, and, and so I, I'm, I'm, that's gonna save me some time. But what I would like to say is from the perspective, not of a trustee, but from the perspective of the community here. Um, and I have talked to a lot of people um, and um, there's a very strong, strong viewpoint that I have discerned that the, the residents do not want uh, to be in residential zones that have been invaded by cannabis production, be it commercial or non-commercial. Um, and Nan was giving an example of a Colorado case which ruled in favor of the farmer. I, what I would point out in response to that case is that the village should be protecting the residents uh, the way it always has tried to do, I think, from this kind of activity. Uh, the residents shouldn't be in the position of having to sue each other to, to remedy uh, uh, nuisances or, or uh, conditions that a zoning ordinance could reasonably control. And the state here has really put, I think, the municipalities in a very awkward position. Um, you know, Nan spent a lot of time talking about the gap, the policy gap between federal uh, controlled substance law and the New Mexico and other states uh, partially decriminalizing uh, uh, cannabis. But we have a real gap in New Mexico between what the legislature and the governor has done and what I think is good for the municipalities. Um, I'm not really gonna talk about the commercial zones because I, I'm, I'm not going to advocate one way or the other on that, but I'm gonna strongly advocate against uh, go, invading uh, our beautiful residential areas here in the village with either commercial or non-commercial cannabis. Uh, I, I don't think those of us who live here and have invested our money here are gonna be comfortable with that. And I personally think that the prohibition that the village has put into place um, uh, already on cannabis activities uh, is, 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 is good for the A1, A2, A3, and AC zones. Um, frankly, I, I, I don't want to see it changed, um, and uh, and and I, I I would urge the the trustees to protect those zones uh, from everything that most people know about cannabis. I mean, the the federal law, and I gave you a memo which I'm not following in my remarks because I'm not going to have time to follow it. But I gave you a memo pointing out uh, the status of the federal uh, law and, and the federal law finds expressively that the, the criminal laws were necessary to protect the public health, safety and welfare and the morals of, of the general public. Um, that justified the criminal um, uh, laws that were enacted and which are still in force. Um, th those are the police powers, the same types of police powers the village has. And those are the police powers that the state is now beginning to 
give you some instructions on what you can and can't enforce. In New Mexico, the New Mexico zoning code and the courts who've interpreted it have been very deferential to municipalities. Uh, they presume that if a municipality through its legislative process uh, enacts ordinances, that those are, those are basically presumed to be valid because they feel that municipalities are in the best position of anyone, including the courts, to decide what is appropriate for that community. And so the focus we need to have is on the public health, safety, welfare, and the morals uh, of, of the residents of this village based on the zone where they've chosen to live and invest their money. Uh, and your, your, our ordinances in this village and the state zoning code take that point of view. And you have already, you, you've got a, a tremendous uh, uh, comprehensive zoning ordinance, which has, is, is focused on protecting this village, protecting its unique and historical aspects, its character zones, and so forth, to allow uh, either private or commercial cannabis activity into the heart of, of the village you've helped create, I think is, is very, very foolish. And I don't care what the state of New Mexico says about it. They may say you cannot prohibit uh, personal cannabis from being raised next door to where you live. Uh, uh, that they can say that, but I'll bet you that most of the people listening to what we're doing tonight would say, not in my neighborhood, uh, and even more so about commercial cannabis operations. What, what's going to happen if you say, no, you can't tell us that we're going to have homegrown cannabis in the, in the neighborhood villages? What's the state going to do about it? Uh, that's something that that none of us can give a firm answer to. Nan didn't spend many time on, any time on that because the law is still developing in that area, and I neither she nor I can assure you of what's going to happen. But I spent almost fifty years as a litigator, and I know what happens when you have a situation where federal law is involved, federal statutes. And I'll give you an example of what could happen here. If you decide no homegrown cannabis in the village, the state then has the, the obligation, I won't say obligation, but they have the discretion to try to enforce their zoning order in court. And I've suggested some language to, to the trustees that would basically continue the prohibition on cannabis, but would also go one step further and say that one reason for that, a big reason, is that uh, that type of activity would violate federal law. And none of us really want to live next to people or organizations who have been told you can violate federal law. And, and so my, my feeling is that if the state wants to truly try to enforce what we can have in our homegrown gardens by saying the village must accept and the residents must accept homegrown cannabis, I think the village is perfectly within its rights to try to protect its residents by saying, nope, not here, you're not. And if you wanna to try to enforce that, We'll see you in court because if they file that case, the first thing I would suggest is that the federal is that the, the village remove that case to federal court. I don't think you're going to find we have a lot of very conservative ju federal judges in New Mexico. I don't think you're going to find many, very many of them that are going to tell the village that you have to go ahead and violate these federal statutes by allowing these types of cannabis activities in your community. And I think the village 
in this particular situation has an obligation to protect its residents against what I would consider ill-advised aspects of the Cannabis Regulatory Act in New Mexico. And I, you know, I, I could go into a lot more detail about what I have in mind, but I think that's really the substance of what I have to say. Um, and and I, I would urge you to look at this from the standpoint of the residents. And I know from recent, recent hearings in front of the village uh, uh, planning and zoning commission and, and the trustees, I know that there is a tendency on the part of village staff to look at the technical requirements, check off all the boxes in these zoning cases. What I've seen is there is not much of a tendency to look at the purposes, uh, the goals and the standards that are recited at length in your zoning ordinances. They have everything to do with the health, welfare, morals, um, and the, the standard of living in your community. In a recent case, which is before the trustees now, which I won't talk about specifically, uh, there, is all, there is virtually no mention of, of those aspects of your zoning ordinance. Uh, the only mention was made by the residents and people like me. And I would say here, let's practice what the village preaches in the purposes, the standards, the goals of your zoning ordinances, your land use regulations, because that is where the people live and that what you have a duty to protect. And if you got to protect it against the state allowing cannabis to be grown next door to your house, then the village ought to protect against that. So my hope and my suggestion, and I, I sent out a, a little memo yesterday and a larger memo today, but the memo yesterday suggested some language. Let's basically stick with the present um, uh, prohibitions, but let's add in there that one reason for that, a very strong reason, is that those activities would violate federal criminal laws. Well, Mr. Eves, you, you've been at it for about 12 minutes now. Are you almost I'm, done? I'm, I'll stop right there. Uh, you've been very patient and uh, there's a lot more that could be said, but uh, I appreciate the time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Eves. Uh, at this time, I'm gonna introduce Katie Duhigg, our state senator for District 10. Uh, Katie, are you on? I am. Mr. Mayor. Please, please proceed. How much time do you think you will need? I don't think I'll need much time, Mr. Mayor. I, I don't have a, a real presentation for you all. That's um, okay. Tell us. Talk to us. So yes, I, I represent District 10, which includes Los Ranchos. Um, I also was the primary Senate sponsor of the Cannabis Regulation Act. Uh, right. So I'm, I'm really here today uh, in hopes of being a resource to you as you are working through these issues. Uh, and to, you know, to the extent that, that you're running into issues that are going up against state law, um, I'd like to, to be a resource to you to, to figure those out. Uh, I, don't, I really don't have a, a dog in this fight uh, one way or the other beyond that. Um, I do want to disclose to you, I'm, I'm also I'm a, uh, an attorney who practices cannabis law, uh, but I want you all to know I don't have any, can or any clients who are seeking to operate in Los Ranchos. Um, so there's no, I have, I have no agenda here other than uh, offering you what insights I have uh, to help Los Ranchos best um, uh, be in compliance with state law as you're figuring this out. I will say I, I respectfully disagree with Mr. Eves that you, you can kind of disregard the state law on it. Um, you'll get sued if you do. Not. I don't know from the state so much as from any, I think any resident of Los Ranchos would have standing to do so. And it would be in state court there. I don't think there would be federal subject matter jurisdiction over this. Wrong. Um, Wrong. Um, we well, can't have any discussion, please. Yes. Go ahead, Ms. Um, 
but I, I do think that it would be a, a legally risky uh, approach for Los Ranchos to take to simply disregard state law. Um, but, but I would, I would be happy to, to discuss that with you all more as you're doing your discussion. I don't really have anything present, uh, to, to present to you all beyond that, but I'm, I'm here as a resource uh, if you need me. Well, thank you very much, Ms. Duhigg. I appreciate your comments. At this point, are there any questions from the trustees? If so, we will have each trustee ask their question before we move on to the next trustee. We have about 10 minutes or so for questions. Trustee Rael, do you have any? Yeah, I just have one question. Uh, the, uh, the word homegrown keeps coming up. The way I see homegrown is you can, if you live there, you can grow it. Now, is there a different definition in state law about homegrown? Does it mean that if you are growing for your personal use, it's okay? Or please tell me what you mean by homegrown. Uh, Nan Winter, can you answer that question? I think the Senator would be better equipped to answer okay, it. Okay, Katie, how about you? Sure. So, so yeah, so the home grow provisions, um, these, this is growing for, for personal use. This is not for commercial. You can't do your home grow and sell that. Um, what it, it restricts home grow to uh, six mature plants at any one time uh, in a household. Um, or if you have multiple adults in a household, you could have up to 12 plants at any one time um, or that, that are mature at any one time. Um, but, but no, it, it would not be for commercial sale or anything like that. This is, this is a personal use provision. Thank you, Ms. Duhigg. Go ahead, Trustee Rael. Any further questions? That's the only question I have. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Lewis. Um, I had a question. Um, in, in the revenue um, numbers that Nan shared with us, or the projections, is there any breakdown as to how much of that revenue would come from sales and how much would come from production? Ms. Winter, can you answer that? Yeah, so this was a very, um, Mayor Commissioner, uh, board member, um, this was a, um, a very high level peak. Those numbers are taken directly from the state's FIR uh, uh, fiscal impact statement. Um, no, there was no breakdown um, as to, you know, whether that's cultivation or manufacturing or retail. Um, and the, the, there's a caveat in the FIR that says um, these numbers are wildly speculative. So it could be magnitudes below that or magnitudes above that. All new ground. Trustee Lewis, does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So your presentation, will we get hard copies of that? Oh, I think absolutely, yes. Okay. Yes. Any further questions, Trustee Lewis? Uh, hang on just one second here. No, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Trustee Pacheco. Mayor, I don't have any questions at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can Trustee Riccabini speak yet or not? Yes, Mayor, I sure can. No, no Thank questions. Thank you. Do you have any time. questions? Not at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move to new business. Item five, discussion. With considerations relevant to the Cannabis Regulation Act and the impact on the village of Los Ranchos to Albuquerque, Proposed Ordinance 282 and Ordinance Repealing Ordinance 273, regulation regulating the growth, sale, and production of recreational cannabis and cannabis products pursuant to the Cannabis Regulation Act of 2021, there are a number of options. Uh, option A is, or actually option one, which is 5A, prohibited in residential, only retail, sale, and commercial. Director Justice, please present. Mayor, trustees, um, so just I want to quick sum up of these different options. There's three different options, and then after this included is the original ordinance that was uh, advertised for adoption uh, under 282, and then behind that is the original ordinance 273 that we have on the books that was adopted back in March, uh, and that's all for reference. So uh, option one is 
essentially equivalent to the ordinance that we currently have in place that prohibits uh, commercial cannabis activities um, or the production of cannabis, cultivation of cannabis, cannabis in residential zones. And it also strictly limits uh, com commercial cannabis activities in commercial zones. Uh, so just going through this ordinance, um, the main difference, I guess, between this ordinance and 273 that's currently on the books is that 273 references the Linen, Air, and Compassionate Use Act for medical cannabis primarily. So this one now uh, references uh, recreational cannabis. And so all references to the Linen, Air, and Compassionate Use Act have been updated to the Cannabis Regulation Act. So even if we stick with the same uh, ordinance that we have in place, this is an updated version with updated references to current state law. So the definitions um, you can see are updated Cannabis Regulation Act. Uh, this also removes the prohibition of hemp. Hemp was included with 273 primarily because of the potential odor that it can create uh, that is similar, we've heard, to uh, cannabis. Uh, but this um, hemp was kind of an innocent player in all of this. Um, so right now, the proposed ordinance uh, does suggest uh, allowing hemp. Uh, but with this, the language for A1 uh, agricultural residential zones under section two does prohibit um, display and sale of cannabis or cannabis products. And it also prohibits um, the same thing for cannabis uh, production activities. Um, the difference here is that we do allow homegrown cannabis uh, because that is personal production. The big difference here is that, so this, the, cannab the Cannabis Regulation Act has said that uh, jurisdictions cannot prohibit personal production of cannabis. That's six plants per person, 12 plants per household that was mentioned earlier. This is separate from commercial uh, sale and production for recreational use um, that is more than just personal production. So uh, we would be prohibiting the larger scale and we would be allowing um, the personal production of six plants per person, 12 plants per household. So, um, and this, this is pretty much consistent with what we've had uh, 273 still allowed personal production of cannabis for medical reasons. Um, so similarly, it's allowed. Um, and only A1 is uh, referenced, not A2, A3, R2, or R3, or other residential zones, because all of those other zones reference back to A1 for the permissive and conditional uses. So by changing just this one ordinance or section of our ordinance, we affect all other residential zones in Los Ranchos. Uh, section three goes over uh, the C1 uh, retail commercial zone, um, and it's echoed in the next section for the village center. Uh, C1 commercial, BC village center, and GD gateway district are mixed use commercial residential zones, primarily along 4th Street. Um, and the, this, uh, the big difference between uh, this and some later uh, options that are presented is that this only allows um, retail sale and consumption areas. This prohibits cultivation and manufacturing in commercial zones. Um, and it also still has a 300 foot buffer between uh, from schools or daycares from cannabis facilities. And these would only be retail sailors um, or consumption areas. Um, and the additional sections four and five for the village center zone and the AC zone are consistent with um, the A1 and C1 uh, zones. AC, uh, the primary uh, permissive uses are those that are allowed in residential areas. So if we prohibit it in residential areas, we're suggesting to prohibit it in the AC zone. Um, Village Center is a mixed use commercial zone. Uh, that one would follow with the C1 zone. Um, before getting into the other ordinances, uh, do I have any questions for option one? So let's go trustee by trustee. Trustee Rael. Uh, no, I don't have any questions at this time. Trustee Lewis. I wanna make sure I'm clear. So option one is allowing homegrown in residential, but banning any commercial activity sales, grow, growing it, any kind of activity, is that correct? Am I understanding? That is correct. Okay, I have no further questions, thank you. 
Thank you. Trustee Pacheco. Um, I'm just curious, Tiffany, why we're allowing hemp when that was um, you know, specifically talked about with the original ordinance? So Trustee Pacheco, Mayor, Trustees, hemp was roped in with cannabis because of its similar smell. However, it's not a federally controlled substance. It's not, uh, I guess, regulated or licensed by the state. Um, it is, I guess, as I said earlier, it's kind of an innocent product in all of this. Um, however, if the board is inclined to prohibit hemp along with cannabis or limit hemp in any way, uh, let me know. Any further okay. questions, Trustee Pacheco? Uh, one other question. Um, shoot, just lost my train of thought. Um, well, maybe I'll remember it in a bit, Mayor. That's fine. Move on. Okay, Trustee Riccabini. Yes, thank you very much. Um, uh, a couple, a couple of items. Is one, I'm, I, as I look at the under B and I look down, well, first of all, let's go back up to uh, section section B number four. I see homegrown listed there for the first time. And I'd like to uh, see a definition of that as we move forward of what homegrown is specifically. And um, uh, so that would be, from what I understand right now, homegrown would be personal homegrown and personal use. Uh, and in item number one, just to clarify, or this first, this first uh, proposal, the uh, it's allowed homegrown in residential, but no commercial activities would be one. And but number two, what I'm hearing is, is that we're that it's allowing commercial sales in, um, um, in commercial, uh, in our commercial corridor. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And for the definition of homegrown, what we can do is uh, similar to the other definitions, uh, make reference to having the same definition as the Cannabis Regulation Act. Okay. Um, I'd like to be, so I don't have to read through all that, but prior to next meeting, I'd like to be provided with a, maybe that section where the definitions occur um, or, or at least a reference to where I can find those. And so I can, I can read those. And then, and then secondly, what I didn't hear was in the commercial areas is sales only, not any production and processing. Is that correct? That is correct. So okay. sale and consumption would be allowed. So the serving of uh, cannabis and cannabis products, as well as the sale. Okay. What I'm, what I'm really not sure of is what a consumption area consists of either. So is a consumption area only personal use on personal property, or is that go further about what a consumption area is? And I know that definition may be in the, the state statute, but can you clarify that for me just right now so we can move yes. forward? Um, so this would be for, I guess, public visitation. This is not like your house. A consumption area would not qualify as your house for your personal personal consumption. Um, this is more of a serving area, kind of how like a brewery serves beer. Um, they make beer and then they sell the beer um, and you can consume the beer on the premises. The consumption of cannabis on the premises is the consumption area part. Um, and Ms. Duhigg, if you can correct me or add anything if I'm wrong, I'd appreciate that. No, no, you're right. And, and, and the the you know, comparing it to a brewery is, is, I think, a good comparison. You have to have a specific license from the state in order to have a consumption area. Um, so it's not just you sitting out with your buddies all consuming cannabis. Uh, this is this would be a licensed activity um, at a specific establishment that for, for, com much. for a commercial purpose. Very good. Okay, no further questions, Mayor. Thank you, Trustee Riccabini. Let's move to 5B, option two. Mayor, prohibited. Can I ask a quick question? Go right ahead, Trustee Pacheco. Go ahead. So, um, Senator Duhigg, are you saying then that there would need to be two permits in order for consumption to take place um, at a retailer site or, or production facility? 
yes. Uh, I mean, if you wanted to both sell, sell cannabis and have people and offer that for consumption at the same location, you would have to have both a retail license and a consumption license to do so. Thank you. And, and, and I'll just note real quickly, one of the biggest parts of local control that you all do have, and the only kind of licensee that you can ban under state law is a consumption area. Um, so, so my reading of your option one, it would, would be in violation of state law because it's, because it's completely banning uh, all these other license types. Um, but the, the one area where you guys have the most power to, to, to really ban something is consumption areas. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Duhigg. Okay, 5B is option two, prohibited in residential, regulated in commercial, Director Justice. Uh, yes, so uh, option two, the definitions are pretty much the same as option one. Um, and uh, taking Trustee Riccobini's note, we'll add homegrown uh, to that definitions list. Um, the difference here is, so these options one, two, and three, they get less restrictive for um, commercial and residential areas as we progress further. So this is gonna be less restrictive than what we just discussed. Um, for section two in the A1 zone, um, this uh, still prohibits commercial uh, cannabis activities in residential areas. It still allows homegrown um, cannabis in residential areas. The, for the, in terms of residential uh, zoning, this is, the, this is the same as option one. Um, the difference here is when it gets into commercial. Um, and so this is gonna be section three. Uh, cannabis, as you can see, instead of having X's for being prohibited, now there's uh, C for conditional use and P for permissive. So um, now facilities are still required to uh, not be located within 300 feet of a school or daycare. That's something that's consistent between all of these options uh, since that's something that the state act allows us to do. Um, cultivation is now permissive. Retail sale is permissive. Consumption areas are permissive. Um, now within these permissive allowances, um, there's still requirements for these uses. Um, not getting into what the state license already requires um, as attorney Winter went over earlier, there's a lot more that um, licensees would be subject to than what is necessarily in our ordinance here. But some things that are highlighted specifically to uh, limit the potential of new systems that can occur um, is that uh, for manufacturing and cultivation, if there's a structure involved, we do say that there needs to be an activated carbon HVAC filtration system uh, so as to effectively abate odor emissions. This is actually something that um, in the cannabis industry, there's best practices for what this would look like for different size structures and different levels of activity. Um, and then for retail sale and consumption areas, uh, this limits um, both of those activities uh, as being prohibited between midnight and 8 a.m. And this is something that we, um, the reason for the midnight to 8 a.m. is because this is what we have for in place for alcohol consumption. Alcohol is slightly, a little bit less restrictive. We allow it as a conditional use from midnight to 2 a.m prohibited 2 a.m. to 8 a.m. Um, this one, we're just saying, you know, from midnight to 8 a.m., uh, no retail sale or consumption. Um, and then the last two options, and this is also something that was uh, highlighted in the in option one and will be also in option three, is that as uh, Ms. Duhigg mentioned, you can have more than one uh, function for um, your cannabis facility. You can do um, cultivation, you can do retail sale, you can do consumption, you can do manufacturing. So we're saying that if you have a facility that does um, any combination of these, if it involves manufacturing, it's a conditional use because manufacturing is a conditional use. If you're doing a combination of these that doesn't involve manufacturing, it's permissive because the others are permissive. Um, and then again, the village center and agricultural commercial zones, those sections are pretty much the same um, as a commercial and residential. So again, option two, prohibits it in uh, residential areas, the same as option one. However, unlike option one, in for commercial, this is less restrictive and it does allow cultivation and manufacturing in uh, commercial zones. And I stand for any questions. Thank you. Let's go trustee by trustee. Trustee Rael. No questions. 
Trustee Lewis. Um, is there is there any magic to this number, or is it just strictly because that's what alcohol is—the midnight to eight a.m.? Do we have do we have jurisdiction over restricting hours or cutting hours back of sales? Uh, so, Trustee Lewis, uh, Mayor Trustees, the reason for uh, the midnight to eight a.m. is because that is what we have in place for alcohol right now. Um, I believe that we could be more restrictive with uh, hours. Uh, consistent with time, place, and manner regulations. Um, the reason why we're matching it with alcohol is because um, the guidance that I've received um, from workshops, informational workshops for cannabis the past few months has been uh, to make it consistent with neighborhood uses. Um, and the comparison has been to alcohol. And so pretty much what our restrictions are for alcohol now applying to cannabis, um, however, if we wanted to be more restrictive, I believe we could, consistent with um, time, place, and manual reg regulations. But uh, this is why we've started here. Okay. Any further uh, questions, Trustee Lewis? Yes. Uh, Ms. Duhigg, did, did I understand we can ban consumption and, and licensing for consumption on the premises? So uh, yeah, trustee, you, you can ban consum commercial consumption areas. So you can't ban consumption. You can't tell the residents of Los Ranchos that they can't consume, sure. that they're not allowed to consume, but you can ban commercial consumption areas. Okay. And, and, and as Ms. Justice said, uh, it the kind of the, the best practices are to, to, to match your, how you're regulating alcohol. Uh, is a good model, and I think a safe one legally for how you're regulating cannabis. Well, I, I, I think it might be a safe one, but I, I can't say necessarily that we're doing a good job of regulating alcohol uh, with our ordinances. So I, I would respectfully disagree with you on that statement. Um, at this time, I don't think I have any other questions. Thank you. Oh. Okay, Trustee Pacheco. I'm just curious to Tiffany, I mean, can we apply additional restrictions? Um, we live in a very unique place. Even in our commercial zone, we have pockets of residential communities. Um, can, we, can we specify uh, locations that can be included or locations that can't be included? Because I think it's gonna, it, it's gonna fall into the same situation with some of the residential zones close to the commercial zones. I have a feeling that, you know, residents will be very, um, they'll voice their concerns, I think, with that as well. So just curious if we can uh, impose other restrictions. Right, and that's, uh, so Trustee Pacheco, Mayor Trustee, that's something that I would defer to Attorney Winter or Ms. Duhigg on. Um, but I would say that just, I guess, it isn't quite as black and white as commercial zone versus residential zone. Our commercial zones are mixed use zones that do allow high density residential. So even if there were restrictions in place um, to buffer or limit um, next to residentially zoned properties, um, there are properties along 4th Street that are residential, but they are zoned uh, commercial. That's the only way to really get higher density uh, residential units like townhomes or apartments. So it's still possible for there to be residential uses um, that wouldn't have that same protection, I guess, if we were to put one in place. Trustee mayor. Pacheco, any further questions? No, oh, I can. Add, Thank you. I can add to that, Mayor. Too. Go ahead. Uh, um, you can also add conditions related to buffering, um, fencing, ingress and egress, um, in a, in a way that protects that residential neighborhood. Uh, and I could probably give you a few other um, suggestions, but buffering is something that comes to mind. Uh, in terms of landscaping um, uh, or, or fencing. Thank you. Trustee Pacheco, any further questions? That's all, Mayor. Thank you. Trustee Riccabini. 
Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, prior to when we when we moved off of the uh, number one, Ms. Duhigg, you mentioned that we had something in there that you thought was um, uh, prohibited from by state law. What what was that specifically again? If we could go back to that. I believe that option one completely prohibits um, some license types. Um, and, and Ms. Justice, please please correct me if I'm wrong, but, um, but to the extent that, that any license type is completely prohibited um, uh, other than a cannabis consumption area, that would violate state law. And, and it's real important too to, to keep in mind when you're looking at these things, staying consistent with neighborhood use. That's also language directly from the statute. So to the extent that you're wanting to not allow commercial activity in a residential area, that is, con that is consistent with neighborhood use. Um, to the extent that you're wanting to not allow commercial activity in a commercially zoned area, that would not be consistent with commercial use and I think would, would violate the state law. W one other thing to mention that was in, in option two, uh, in option three about you've made just manufacturing conditional use and the others permissive. It's not clear to me what the reason for that is. Why just manufacturing? If, if it's an odor issue, I would think that those concerns would apply equally to uh, product cultivation, um, especially as well. So I just wanted to, to throw that out there for you all, uh, maybe looking more closely at, at why why one would be conditional as opposed to permissive and not the others. And I, you know, and what I'm hearing right now is that manufacturing, uh, um, cultivation are different. And in my mind, they're all kind of the same. Yeah, so, no, they're, they are different. So cultivation, or we actually use per, the word production um, in the statute. So that's growing. Um, manufacturing would be, is anything from extracting oils from cannabis to using already extracted oils, like let's say to make an edible. Um, uh, and then retail is the direct sale to consumer. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty, they're very separate. Uh, they're separate license types and, and pretty separate activities. Although while a licensee could get uh, integrated license, to allow them to do multiple activities, um, they are distinct. Okay, Trustee no Riccabini. No further, no further questions right now. Okay, so we're gonna move to item C, which is option three, regulated in residential and commercial, Director Justice. Mayor, trustees, um, as mentioned before, these get less restrictive uh, as we progress. So this is gonna be the least restrictive option. Um, this one would, allow uh, cannabis uh, beyond personal production. Um, this, the same restrictions that would apply for cannabis in commercial zones would apply in residential zones. So um, you can see that in section two, uh, the requirements for sale and the requirements for cannabis activities are the same as the C1 uh, zone. So we say, um, well, we, add, we added specifically that uh, facilities shouldn't be, shall not be located within 300 feet of one another. Um, so it's slightly more restrictive uh, than in the commercial zones, but we have that uh, 300 foot restriction. And then we also have a 300 foot restriction from a school or daycare. Um, structures, again, need to have that HVAC system um, and uh, sale, of course, is prohibited between midnight and 8 a.m. Um, one thing that is slightly different is that uh, we've included that uh, if the agri agricultural activity that requires state licensure, um, part of that license uh, requirement is to provide proof of water availability, we want a copy of that water availability. This is already a requirement that is uh, required by the state. Uh, we would just get an additional copy for um, our records um, in terms of the water availability for that property, uh, water consumption, um, that kind of thing, because there is concern that cannabis is a water intensive use. Um, and other than that, the language is pretty much the same. Um, you'll notice that with making it permissive with those regulations in the A1 zone, that also changes the AC zone um, and they are essentially the same. Um, and I stand for any questions. 
Thank you, Director Justice. Okay, let's go trustee by trustee. Trustee Rael. No questions. Trustee Lewis. No questions. Trustee Pacheco. No questions. Trustee Riccabini. No questions. Before I move to trustee informal discussion, Director Justice, you mentioned something early in the meeting about raising hands. What did you mean by that? Uh, Mayor, uh, if I could get a little bit more context for that, I would appreciate it. Um, well, did you want the trustees to give you an opinion now or to talk to you oh. after the meeting prior to us moving into next week's BOT meeting? Um, well, Mayor, trustees, I would like some direction on which of these options you would be more inclined to vote in favor of. Um, of course, knowing that there may be some changes between now and uh, potentially next Wednesday, such as the addition of the definition of homegrown to the definitions. Um, I've heard potentially some discussion about the consumption areas, uh, that kind of thing. But I would like to get some direction from the trustees at this point, um, whether that is raising hands for which option you prefer or uh, just you know saying which one you even don't want that kind of thing. Well, let me ask Attorney Winter a question. Attorney Winter, this uh, meeting is presented as an informational meeting. So it seems to me that we might run afoul if we try to, uh, to do something like that, but tell me what you think. Yeah, Mayor, I think, um, I mean, there's plenty of time between now and next week for uh, trustees to contact um, Ann or, yes. um, or, or Tiffany. Um, yeah, and I would rather keep this meeting informational. Yes, I agree with that. So let's move to trustee informal discussion. Uh, uh, Mayor, table Mayor, discussion. Go ahead, Mayor, uh, Trustee Mayor, Just real quick, is um, I, I'm, I'm trying to, I, I can understand there's a progression as we move through this and, I, and I'm gonna re-familiarize myself with the definitions a little bit tighter. But is, is number one, the the very I, I'm I'm wondering what is the very highest uh, um, uh, prohibition that we can go. It seems like to me that that would be uh, allowing um, homegrown, quote unquote, and I, I understand that. And then and then everything else could be pretty much banned. Is that correct? That I. Am I understanding that right? Because number one is not that particular. Maybe we need a an additional uh, option to look at. And and uh, um, Tiffany is is number one is allowing commercial sales, right? Uh, so uh, just Mayor Trustees, I want to clarify. Option one is the current option is the current ordinance that we have in place. When the trustees visited this topic back in March, we decided as a community to ban cultivation in uh, and any cannabis activities in residential areas, allowing personal production, and similarly ban cultivation and manufacture in commercial zones. At that time, we allowed retail sale. Okay, so the only real difference then with option one, uh, there's really no, no difference in option one except for we're aligning with state statute that says homegrown would be allowed. Yes, that, yeah. and I would I would also say that we're we're updating our definitions to be consistent. We're no longer referencing the Linden Air and Compassionate Use Act, which was for medical con, medical cannabis. Um, the difference here, um, and I guess a relatively big difference, is that we didn't identify consumption areas with Ordinance Two Seventy Three. This one, Option One, does, and this one does allow for consumption areas. That is okay, something that so we can change. But that, that's the big difference, I guess, between the two ordinances. Okay, so, so, so to go to the most restrictive while following state law would be to ban consumption areas as well. I, uh, Trustee Riccobini, I don't, I wouldn't say that it's following state law. Okay. Like that is, that is, so what I'm saying is consistent with the ordinance that we currently have in place. I'm not speaking at all about compliance with state law. Okay, Ms. Duhigg, can you, can you uh, reference that please? Sure, yeah, your, your option one does not comply with state law. 
um, in banning, in banning license, like in banning production and manufacturing just completely, that in and of itself would, would violate state law. Trustee Riccobini. Okay, I, I, I would like to see a, an additional um, option that follows state law um, and um, uh, so that we can at least look at it um, and, um, and, and is the most limiting on, on the rest of the, the process. And so I'm, I'm seeing that we haven't, we're not quite there yet. And so is what I'm hearing. So, Director of Justice, do you have an answer to that? Uh, so, Mayor, Trustees, Trustee Riccobini, um, the problem that we're coming across with being compliant with state law is that, well, so options two and three are compliant with state law. That, and, but are they the most restrictive? I, do, I can't answer that. And I don't know that there is an option be, like more restrictive, a 1.5, that is more restrictive than option two right now. Hopefully that may answer your question, Trustee Bicabini. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either, Mayor, and I just need some more time to think this through. And, and Thank we'll, you. We'll... We lost your sound. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yes, thank you. No further okay. questions. Okay, thank you. We're gonna to move to trustee informal discussion. Roundtable discussion is informal. The Board of Trustees will take no official vote or other official action. Trustee Rael. I just have one thing. I, I just wanna thank staff to, for putting up the, the street sign on Sarah Lane and 4th Street uh, that had been missing for so long. I can say thank you and that's all I have, thanks. All right, Trustee Lewis. Um, I don't have anything at this time. Okay, Trustee Pacheco. Um, I, I just do have one question, but can I go back to what we were talking about? Of course, absolutely. Okay. So I, I did hear that some other jurisdictions, other municipalities are imposing a uh, moratorium into their ordinance. And I'm just curious what that involves, what that means, and is it is it something that we could set a time frame for if we want to if we do want to restrict? And I'll I'll have to ask both the uh, attorney winner and maybe uh, Senator Duhigg kind of their their thoughts on that. So Nan, why don't you try that first? Um, I understand the city of Albuquerque mayor trustee has um, a, a moratorium in place. Um, I'm not sure. You know, the risk you run with a moratorium is that somebody locates within your village limit during the moratorium period and then pursuant to the the act, you are precluded from doing anything about him. He, he's grandfathered in for all intents and purposes. Um, I have not paid much attention to the city of Albuquerque's, um, you know, adjudication of this issue. Uh, maybe the senator knows more about that. So Katie, uh, what do you, how do you want to answer that? So my understanding is that what the city of Albuquerque did was that they said specific to Old Town, there's a moratorium um, and it's temporary until we get, get things more figured out for that limited area. I think there's, there's a question about whether they were allowed to do that, but, but I think that there's a reasonable argument to be made that because they were not it wasn't a moratorium that applied to the entire city, that, that they could be, be, because they weren't effectively completely banning licensees by doing that, but just talking about a very specific area um, and it was time limited. I, I think that, that there, they had a, good, a, good, a reasonable basis for doing that. Um, but I, I'm not familiar. I, I know that there was, was another local government that was thinking about just a flat moratorium or saying just nothing at all. Um, I think that would be very risky. I think that would clearly violate state law. So Trustee Pacheco, any further discussion? That's all, thank you. Okay, so I'd like to make the statement that I would like to remind everyone of the Village of Los Ranchos' candidate forum tomorrow night, Thursday, October 7th from 7 to 8.30 p.m. It will be streamed on the Village website and Facebook page. 
So I'm going to adjourn the meeting. The time Mayor, is Mayor, Mayor. Go right ahead. Uh, Trustee Riccabini didn't have his opportunity for informal discussion. Oh, I'm sorry. Go, go right ahead, Trustee Riccabini. I, I, I have, have two items, and thank you sure. very much, Mayor. And um, I'm still concerned with option one, if we're violating state law, and yet option two and three don't violate, I'd like to understand at, uh, before, we, before we come to a, any kind of a decision, what we need to do that will will comply with state law and what that that would what that would have to happen in order for that to occur while being as restrictive as we can i don't have that option yet so it makes i'm i'm a little bit conflicted because if i if i if i move towards something that violates state law then that's a problem so or it appears to be a problem um, that being said if we do go with the most restrictive, and and is these is this the kind of thing that would go up to a vote of our citizens ultimately, to to open up and be less restrictive, or is it just simply a call that we should be making at the uh, at the uh, uh, trustee level only? Um, I, I'm just uh, interested with what the rest of the trustees have to say about that. Well, let's go trustee by trustee. Trustee Rael, do you have any opinion on that? I think that's our job to decide what we want to do and go with it, even if it violates state law. And then somebody's going to probably sue us and then we'll settle it in court. But I don't think we have to go that far. I think there's a way to to, to uh, maybe insert some wording on, on option one so that it can be, um, so it would meet state law. Trustee Lewis, do you have any opinion on that issue? Well, my understanding, if, if I'm correct, is option one bans all licenses except retail sales in a commercial zone. And if we allowed production and manufacture in either a certain area of, of commercial zones or in all commercial zone, if I understand correctly, that's where we're not in compliance with state law. Director Justice, can you weigh in on that? Mayor, trustees, option two is the less, uh, is, is the version that is compliant with state law that, that the big changes. So option two, it's still banned in residential that stays the same. The difference is with commercial. Option one, right now, it, it bans cultivation and manufacturing. That's what we have on the books. The difference between option one and option two is that we now no longer say that it's prohibited in commercial zones. You can grow and manufacture in commercial zones. Therefore, uh, we're not completely prohibiting a licensee. We're allowing them to operate in our commercial zones. So that that is the big difference is option one, we're saying you cannot cultivate or manufacture anywhere in Los Ranchos. Option two, we're saying you can cultivate and manufacture and sell in our commercial zones. But Does that can, uh, answer the question? Go ahead. But we can restrict. We don't have to open it to all commercial zones. We can say you can sell in, in, in C1, but you can manufacture and produce in this portion of C1, in this location of the village. Is that, are we, are we getting too broad when we say it's totally open for any commercial area in the village? Mayor, I can add a little color on that. Go ahead. If you're gonna allow it and say, allow production and manufacturing in a commercial zone, you can say, it will be um, accomplished on a lot of at least this size. Um, so in that way, you are allowing it, but restricting it to something that can accommodate it. Um, and again, uh, you know, um, you can tailor it. Um, it's, a, it's a needle you have to thread, unique to your village, uh, but I think you can you can distinguish that operation in a commercial zone by um, whether it's in the VC 
whether it's in the fourth street, whether it's in the um, transitional area or maybe by lot size, um, or um, you could even, you know, maybe even distinguish that, that operation by something that's not adjacent to residential. Um, so you can craft this any way you want, um, specific to who you are as a village. Uh, Thank you, Attorney Winter. So that goes okay. back to consistent use in a neighborhood. And so we need this. It sounds to me like we need to be in compliance. We, ha we cannot ban certain licenses, but we can focus harder than on how to restrict them. Is that correct? And Mayor Trustee, I wouldn't say restrict. I would say um, tailor it to the neighboring needs. Um, so you don't, you know, you don't, I'm not a fan of the word restrict on the record, um, but I, I think you want to tailor it to um, what's important to you. Um, I, I think um, you have character areas and maybe this, maybe manufacturing and cultivation should be um, um, limited to certain character areas in commercial zone or commercial zones in certain character areas. Um, but, and, and Ms. Duhigg? And yeah, as long as you are staying consistent with neighborhood use, that's what's gonna be a, a determining factor and whether this is a reasonable, uh, a reason, I, now I can't think of any word other than restriction, but <laughs> Ms. Nan's right. It's not not a good word, but but yeah, I think that is that is what in making each of these decisions, making sure that you're staying consistent with neighborhood use, and 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 for for all the trustees um, and Ms. Justice, as you all are are looking to to craft an ordinance that complies with state law, but is still as restrictive as as you would like it to be, I'm happy to any assistance I can give with that, I'm happy to do so. Um, you know, there's other little things you can do even just around like the, the 300 foot thing where you're measuring that from. Are you measuring it door to door or lot to lot? Um, other things like that. And I, I think there's a couple other little issues in there that, that would help just avoid headaches down the road, having a, a specific clause in there that that's grandfathering in the existing folks um, so that you don't, Run into to issues around that, uh, but I'm 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 happy to to work with any and all of you offline to to accomplish to get to a, an ordinance that that both stays consistent with state law and respects what what you all want to do uh, in Los Ranchos. Are we Thank able you. to change the? You mentioned the 300 foot. Would that be a uh, setback, uh, essentially? So that the 300 feet, that is for 300 feet from any schools or daycares, okay. that part All is right. in state law. But in Very one good. of your options, you also had a density limitation for 300 feet between cannabis establishments. Um, some pla places don't want a green mile. They don't want them all bunched up, bunched together. And, and in, that, in that proposal, it included that. Um, one one other true. thing you guys might think about for just economic development purposes is for that in that density requirement, having an exception for micro businesses. Um, so, to the extent that you have very small uh, cannabis entrepreneurs in Los Ranchos, and and if you if you want to encourage that business development, you could have exceptions just for them, but that would not apply to to bigger folks. Any further questions, uh, Trustee Riccabini? There, no, sir. Go ahead, Trustee Ryan. Uh, Senator Duhigg, when you say micro business, can we restrict it to that, or, or can we do we have to allow the the, the major or the bit, the bigger uh, commercial business to uh, must be allowed to be allowed the micro businesses? I think so, Trustee. I, I don't think that you could say we only will allow micro businesses um, because that would be completely banning. Like if someone had a, a full production license, that would effectively completely ban them. So, but you can do things that would encourage more micro businesses in your community um, as opposed to, to the bigger guys. Can I Thank ask you. a question? Um, yeah, go ahead, Trustee Pacheco. Senator Duhigg, and I think you'll be the, the best one to answer this. 
are the commercial growers, do they, is there a certain amount of, of area that is conducive to that, that type of business? I mean, does it make sense to, to do a, a half acre or a quarter acre planting versus two or three acres? You know, to be honest, and, and I don't know for sure on this, but my, my gut says no, only because for folks who are doing indoor grows and they have racks and they're just using the vertical space, those, those acreage limitations aren't really gonna matter. Um, and a lot of the, the bigger producers, I mean, you, when you do indoor grows, you make a product that sells at a much higher uh, level than the product you get from outdoor grows. So uh, most people are going to be doing indoor grows and are gonna be using that vertical space instead. Um, so I'm not sure how effective land size uh, limitations would be. But building size limitations would obviously um, bring that down. Yeah, yeah. And Mayor, uh, Trustee, the, um, there's a gentleman and um, the Senator probably knows, Jason Marks. Um, and Jason is um, a well-respected PRC attorney and a, and a marijuana attorney. Um, and I've had several conversations with him, but um, he gave me quite the education on um, growing outdoors, growing in greenhouses, growing in hoop houses, and right. growing in, in warehouses. Um, and, you know, they each come with their own challenges. Um, from his perspective, the, you know, growing in a hoop house is probably the sweet spot in terms of revenue to the producer. Um, plant sizes are bigger outdoors, but you have one growing season. Plant sizes are smaller indoors, but you potentially have four growing seasons. So there's a ton of magic that goes into um, production and manufacturing. Um, I don't know how to translate that though yet in terms of crafting something that works for you. But I mean, you know that you know what Fourth Street looks like. Um, you know your other commercial zones. So you have to sort of think about lot sizes there the character area there, um, the residential pockets that are tucked in there, and um, and and get creative if you think if you see something special. So, Attorney Winter, that's a great segue. It's five thirty-one. Do the trustees want to adjourn this meeting? Move to. I'll move to adjourn. Okay. I need a second. Second. I need all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay, it's 5.30, 2 p.m. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate Thank you, everybody. It. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.